Welcome to WestConnect, connecting you with the art of data visualization and storytelling. Uh, my name is Sagar Kapoor, part of customer success team at Tablo. Welcome back to WestConnect. Today we have a special guest. Uh, she's an IMWIS finalist, and it's great to go ahead and learn from her today tips for data storytelling and what we can and how we can go ahead and apply it. So before that, let me just go ahead and introduce Kim Lee. Kim Lee works as an analytics manager where she helps her company use data effectively. She's a, currently a Tableau Public Ambassador, co-lead for diversity in data, and a 2022 IMWIS finalist. If you have not gone ahead and seen her visualization, please go ahead and do that. Her passion for highlighting diversity has led her to recently start a blog in an effort to showcase women in data this. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Kim Lee to talk to us about uh, tips for data storytelling. Kim Lee, over to you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that for that introduction. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I know with the different time zones, it you know down here in Melbourne, we're kind of a bit ahead of everyone. So um, I do appreciate you taking the time to join. Um, so first, I'm going to start off with um, a little bit uh, more about myself for those who don't know me. So um, Sega gave a really good introduction. Um, uh, I'm an analytics manager, so I work for a company called Lux Asia, and um, we're actually a beauty distributor, and they're headquartered in Singapore, although I myself am located in Melbourne. Um, and uh, through my work, I manage our analytics roadmap and strategy, um, and I build and curate um, our suite of reports for, for the region. So I started in data visualization um, when my previous company um, started to use Tableau. Um, and, you know, since, since then, um, probably about five years ago, I've been using it every day since, you know, in my current job, um, and also creating personal visualizations in my spare time as well. And um, the time creating these personal visualizations has led me to, um, you know, like Sega said earlier, um, the this year's Tableau conference in Las Vegas, um, participating as one of the INVIS finalists. Um, so that was a great experience. I learned a lot, um, and I met a lot of a lot of great people as well. Um, a little bit about me personally. Um, uh, as you can see here on the slide, I'm a big time space nerd. Um, and if you have a look at my Tableau public profile, you'll see that um, there's many visualizations um, on my profile related to space, um, just because <laughs> I love it so much. Um, so I just want to share a little bit about why I love data visualization. Um, so for me, with data visualization, um, it means that I can be creative. Um, sometimes, and I know you've probably, probably seen yourself, some data visualizations can be, you know, works of art, um, and I've seen some truly beautiful visualizations. Um, I, I love data visualization because I can learn a lot about different things. So building visualizations in my spare time, um, you know, on topics that I'm, I'm interested in, but I may not know a lot about, um, it kind of forces me to research the topic. And, you know, sometimes I can not get lost, um, spend hours lost in that research. Um, with data visualizations, um, you know, we can bring important messages to life. Uh, subjects that I'm passionate about, such as, you know, diversity and gender equality, um, you'll find many of those um, visas related to those topics, again, on my Tableau public profile. Um, and for me, it's, um, you know, visiting in my personal time, um, it allows me to kind of, um, you know, work on my me time and um, I, sometimes I can get lost in creating a viz. So, I, you know, I can be working on a viz for hours. Um, and then realize it's quite late and, you know, I should, I should get to bed. So, you know, it's something that, that, um, I really do like, um, and, you know, I do like to spend my time, my time doing, um, so in this lesson, I'm going to share, uh, sorry, in this session, I'm going to share six lessons that I've learned during my own journey. Um, and I hope that, you know, that these can be of use for you that you can apply to your own learnings and to your own work. Um, and along the way, I want to share some of my, um, Tableau public work with you, where I've kind of applied those learnings, um, the work that, you know, that I've put together um, to reinforce the, those lessons that I've learned. Um, and 
all of my work on Tableau Pub Public is downloadable. So I've made them downloadable. So you can go in and download them and see how they're built um, if you want to. So um, sometimes when we're looking at data um, as analysts, all we see are the numbers and it's, it's, you know, it's easy to get lost in those numbers, but behind the data, um, I think we have to remember um, that data and those numbers can, write, can lie real people. So lesson number one, um, data can be people. So one of the things that we've seen a lot in the last um, two and a half years um, is visualizations around you know, COVID um, and, and the pandemic. So we've seen um, lots of visualizations around you know, the number of cases and hospitalizations, um, deaths related to COVID and you know, vaccines administered, that kind of thing. Um, and you know, in the early days of the pandemic, there were countless visualizations depicting the increase in, in these positive case numbers and the increase in death rate. Um, you know, I, I saw a lot of them and you probably would have seen them too. And you know, this got me wondering that it's so good that people are embracing data and data visualization to track this issue. So everyday people looking at these graphs um, and using data to make their decisions. Um, but we also have to remember that the people that we're charting, um, you know, the, the deaths that we're charting, these are people as well. You know, they're people's mothers, grandparents, friends, and, and children. Um, you know, the most recent example of that is the ongoing war in Ukraine. So when the war first started, um, you know, people started fleeing their homes and there was a massive influx in Ukrainian refugees. And with that, um, I saw a massive influx in visualizations um, depicting the flow of refugees to neighboring countries. Um, but, you know, we do have to remember that these are refugees, these are people who are actually escaping for their lives. Uh, so me, I always try to remember that behind the data, um, real people exist and we have to be sensitive in the way that we represent that data. So the first example that I want to show you um, is this viz, um, it's called obstetric, ob I can't say this word, obstetric um, fistula in Madagascar. And it looks at the impact of um, fistulas in childbirth. And this particular viz was created for Make Over Monday. Um, and fun fact about this viz, um, it was my very first um, Tableau public viz of the day. So fistula is a childbirth injury that happens to women um, who don't have uh, access to medical help when they're in labor. And we see this occurring in low income countries. Um, fistula are nearly non-existent in high income countries. Um, so we have, we have data here, um, which is used to create the, the, the charts and, and the viz um, and its numbers. But behind these numbers, there are real women who are affected by fistula and they're living the after, aftermath of, the in, of their injury. Um, so in this viz, I wanted the audience to know each and every single one of these women. Um, and we can see, you know, each dot here is, um, is someone who, um, who has been affected by um, fistula and, you know, how as a result of their surgery, um, how many healthy years they've gained, how many healthy years they've lost. Um, and we can actually see each and every one of these women and their, their personal story. Um, so this was, you know, one of the first visits that I created, which um, made me kind of think about um, the fact that there are people behind these numbers and um, these people who lives matter and, um, you know, the story that I wanted to tell um, using this data. Um, so you'll, today, you'll see today that I put a lot of myself into my work um, and that's because I tend to viz about what I'm passionate about and about my experiences. Um, so this is a viz that I created for the IronViz finals, if you haven't seen it. Um, the data supplied was country level education data um, and demographic data. And after struggling for some time to come up with a meaningful story with the data, I decided once again to put myself into the viz. So I focused on two countries um, from the data set, Australia and Cambodia, and then I compared their literacy rates. And I looked at the data through the lens of, of what is, of what if. So that was a story that I wanted to take. Um, 
And um, through this, this visualization and through my story, I wanted to speak to those underrepresented, underrepresented people and I wanted to provide a human face to the data points and the numbers that we see. So um, th there's a bit of interaction in this vid that you can go in and click through the, um, the containers to show um, you know, what impacts literacy rate um, and then what, does, um, what impact does literacy rate have on a nation? So, we can, we're comparing Cambodia and Australia. So if I had lived in Cambodia, you know, what would my life expectancy be, um, or what would it be um, in Cambodia versus here in Australia? So again, providing that human face behind the data and the numbers that we see. Um, so the next example is another personal viz that I created about the topic of miscarriage um, and another one that was selected for viz of the day. Uh, so I created, I created it for um, Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day um, in October last year. And you'll notice when you first load up the viz, you'll see that, that you can't see any data or um, any charts or anything. You'll notice that there's a content warning. Um, so I have a trigger warning. And um, if you want to see the, the data set, you need to click through to continue to the visualization. Um, so using this method, um, you know, we take people's sensitivities into account and we take their, their triggers into account and we put them in the driver's seat. Um, we allow them to interact with the viz if they want to. Um, and, you know, if they feel that it's going to be trigger, too triggering for them, they don't need to click to click through. Um, so the reason why I created this viz was, you know, there's so much stigma and shame surrounding miscarriage um, in all parts of the world. And I just wanted to start that conversation and highlight the fact that there is no shame and those that experience pregnancy and and um, you know and loss, uh, then they're not statistics. They're they're people. They're they're you and they're me, um, and something that I've experienced before. Okay, so this brings us to color. So color, um, as I think everyone knows, is very important in data visualization. Um, so you know, lesson number two here is uh, use color wisely. Um, how many times have we seen a data visualization where the creator has used, you know, so much color and overabundance of color that it's lost all meaning? Um, so color can make or break a viz, and my motto is to use colors uh, wisely and sparingly. Um, we can use colors um, to trigger certain cues within a viz, but we do need to be mindful of how, um, you know, how color is used because different colors um, can have different meaning to different people. Um, you know, and sometimes uh, this may hard, be hard for some to grasp and, you know, it took me a long time to, to grasp this as well. Um, but sometimes we don't need to use colour at all, you know, we, 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 we can use um, uh, black and white, we can use, you know, a, a monochrome colour palette. Um, colour, the, the, the absence of colour can also tell a story. And deciding on the right colour palette to use, um, for me, it's often one of the most timing co consuming parts of creating and designing a viz. And, you know, I can spend um, a lot of time going back and forth between um, different colour palettes. Um, my next viz looks at um, energy usage by time of day over one year at 10 Downing Street, um, home to the UK Prime Minister. And this was another, another early Make Over Monday visualization. So here we can see the brighter the color, the more electricity is used. So that's normally um, concentrated during the, the, the middle of the day. Um, so we associate energy and electricity with you know, brightness and turning the lights on. So using this color coding, um, we can see quickly um, due to the bright and the dark areas, when in the day or the year um, that energy is being used the most and the least often. So um, it's a good example of using colour to, to trigger those cues and to quickly um, tell your audience or tell your reader um, what's happening and where to concentrate and focus on the viz. Um, so this next example is my iInviz entry for uh, 2020. And the theme for this particular, um, for this, for this iInviz uh, was um, health and wellness. Um, and true to my passion for focusing on women's issues, um, I decided to viz about maternal health. So as you can see, as I scroll down this viz, um, you can see that I've used 
a very, very minimal color palette. So I've got a dark background um, and, you know, against um, this dark background, I've got some call outs, which is highlighted in um, this dark red that um, contrasts to the, 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 dark, the dark background and the text. Um, so it's used to highlight important facets of information that I want the, 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 the audience to, um, to pay attention to or to draw their attention to. Um, and you know, one of these main issues and themes to stand out and not be missed. So as we scroll down the viz, we can see how um, the, the reds are used to, to call out certain aspects. So most maternal healths are presentable, uh, preventable. Um, it's used in the scatter plot and then it's used to you know, highlight um, the percentage of women who'd had you know, prenatal visits um, around the world. Um, and then again, um, a really important bit of information, you know, if we fall short of the target that we've set, um, uh, you know, we will, uh, yeah, we will fall short of that target that we've set um, in terms of preventing maternal, maternal health. So, um, you know, for me, this is a good example of how a minimal color palette can be used to tell a story and create, create impact and draw attention. Um, so this next view is sizing up the moons. Um, you can see is uh, an example of uh, a black and white viz. Um, and it's also a great example of how the colors I use in this published version of the viz. It actually looked nothing like how I envisaged, envisaged it when, um, when I started. So when I started planning this viz and collecting data and working on it, um, I experimented with so many different color combinations. Now, this is where, you know, I go back and forth with, um, you know, different color palettes and different color combinations. So I tried, you know, shades of gray. I tried, br I tried bright poppy colors. I tried, you know, soft pastel colors. Um, but then I kind of binned it all because I didn't like the look of it. Nothing looked right. And I actually abandoned the project for a couple of months. Um, and then a couple of months later, um, Sarah Bartlett, who runs IronQuest, um, they had, um, the theme for that particular month was a black and white themed. Um, and then, so I thought, actually, this might actually work for this particular viz. And as you can see, um, it did, and I'm quite happy with the way it turned out. Um, it's one of my favorite vizes actually, because, um, you know, I think the colors or the lack of color um, really worked well. And it actually suits the topic because, you know, we're looking at space um, and we're looking at, you know, the, the, the darkness and the emptiness um, and the blackness of space. So going back to the last point in the slide, the previous slide, um, you know, it's a good example that you don't need um, to use color uh, to make an effective viz. And, you know, don't afraid to bin those colors, um, stick with, you know, simple, monochrome, you can even go with the, the black and white option. So the hot topic in um, data visualization at the moment is um, accessibility. And, you know, recently I started to learn about designing um, data visualizations for accessibility. Um, so my number three lesson here is design for accessibility. Um, and this means being aware um, that some people don't see things the same way as we do or you do. Um, and not everyone interacts with a laptop or a computer screen the same way as, um, as you do as well. So with this in mind, you know, when designing a data visualization, think about the, 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 um, the colors that you use and the images that you use. So, you know, will people with color blindness or low contrast or low vision um, or, or people who have a vision deficiency are they able to see and make sense of your of your visualization? So, you know, how can someone who can't use a mouse um, and, you know, how can, how can they interact with your visualization? How does your visualization look and interact on a mobile phone or a screen reader? So these are the, the things that I'm starting to think about um, and ensuring that, you know, that when I build and design my visualizations, um, I take these things into account. So I wanted to show everyone this online tool. Um, it's a tool that allows you to check the contrast of your colors. Um, and the, the URL of it is up here. Um, it's the web aim. Um, and what you can do is you can put input your foreground and your background colors. 
Um, and then it will let you know whether the, um, the contrast between the two colors that you've chosen are high enough. And as you can see in this preloaded example, um, the, color, the color chosen um, passes the, the contrast test. But uh, what if we change the colors that we input here? So um, just say I change the foreground color to that, and then I change the background color to um, this kind of tanny, tanny pink color. So we can see here that um, the, the two colors that we've chosen fail the test. So the contrast between these two colors, um, they're too low. So, you know, um, we won't be using the, these colors in our, um, in, in our viz together. Uh, the next demo I want to show you, or uh, the next thing I want to show you is um, this famous uh, color um, color blind test. So um, color vision deficiency um, affects approximately one in 12 men and one in 200 women in the world. And 99% of all color blind people suffer from um, red green color blindness. Um, and this is character characterized by the inability to disting in distinguish um, between red and green color pigments. And so this famous test um, for testing color blindness shows what people with regular vision see. So the people on this side here, what they see um, versus what people with red and green color blindness see. Um, so we can see some of these circles, uh, the numbers are not apparent because um, red and green are used together and people with this color, blind, uh, color deficiency, they can't distinguish between those two color pigments. Um, so I guess the key, key takeaway here is that, you know, when we're designing business dashboards, um, you know, traditionally we, we would use, you know, um, red to show um, decreases in, you know, things like KPIs and trends um, and green um, when we want to show increases um, in those particular metrics. Um, so we need to kind of rethink how we, how we um, use those color, color cues in, in our reporting. Um, so in this viz, uh, another space viz, <laughs> so you can see, as you can see, I'm obsessed with space and, you know, I think there's probably like four or five more um, space related visits on my public profile. Um, so this one exploring our, um, our solar system, I created uh, this, this arc chart to show where the probes um, that we have sent out into space um, and where that they currently are. So we can see here, you know, Voyager 1 and 2 are kind of quite far out into interst interstellar space. And, you know, due to these vast distances, we can see um, it's really hard to see those probes here that are close to Earth. And it's kind of hard to highlight them because they're so close together, um, we can't see the individual lines. So what I've done is I've shown a zoomed in view here which is basically um, this section in the circle zoomed in. So we can actually see without um, physically zooming in um, the, the lines more, more easily and highlight them more easily. Um, so I guess um, for me, when I'm designing and building a, a, a data visualization, I try to keep in mind the, the principles of accessibility. Um, but, you know, I'm still kind of learning about this, this area of data visual, visualization and there's still so much more to learn, um, you know, doing things that um, you can interact with on a keyboard or um, adding, uh, you know, explanations around the, the, the charts that, that, that you're using and what you see in the charts. So they're, they're things that I'm kind of still researching and learning and um, incorporating into my data visualizations. So someone asked me a while back, um, you know, what makes my current approach to data visualization unique or different? And, you know, I think my style um, is to keep things simple and, and minimal. Um, so lesson number four is to, to keep things simple, just like the, you know, the saying that everyone's probably all heard, you know, keep it simple make the main takeaways in the data visualization as easy to understand as possible. Keeping things simple is, um, you know, about removing um, things such as, you know, chart junk or um, cluttering such as, you know, unnecessary access or grid lines or labels, um, that kind of thing, you know, avoiding distractions such as 
overpowering images, which, you know, takes the focus away from your data and doesn't add anything to the story that you want your data to tell. Um, and you would have noticed in the examples that I've shown so far, the simplicity in my design. So I use minimal images and I tend to stick to, you know, standard bar and line charts. Sometimes I might veer off and, you know, experiment with a funky chart or a radial chart, um, but that's not often um, because I think, you know, using those simple charts, it's, it's easy to get your message across and it's easy for someone who doesn't have, you know, such high data literacy skills, um, they can easily understand the message that you want to convey as well. So this particular viz, um, another Makeover Monday viz actually, um, looks at survey responses from Africa, Asian and South American countries to gauge the attitude on violence against women and girls amongst the responders. So um, in this viz, I wanted to succinctly um, to show the countries that uh, where respondents thought violence against women and girls was justified, as well as the split between um, you know, males and females um, and the education level of, of each of the respondents. Um, so in depicting these different permutations, I decided to use this simple heat map um, with a simple sequential color palette where, you know, the lighter the orange means that, um, re, you know, less respondents agreed with the statement and the darker the orange meant that uh, more respondents agreed with the statement. So with this visual, it's easy to see where respondents are more likely to justify violence against women, you know, by country, the darker the colour, um, by, you know, by gender, female and male based on the colour, um, as well as the education levels and the permutation. So, you know, um, primary educated uh, females in Chad tend to agree with the statement more often than, you know, higher educated females in, in Angolia. So it's easy to compare and contrast um, between those different, uh, you know, segments of people as well. Um, this next viz uh, was created in support of changing the date of Australia Day here in Australia. So I wanted to show, simply show um, that Australia's Indigenous and First um, Peoples were thriving in Australia long before um, the white settlers arrived. Um, so I use this simple depiction depiction. So um, I'm actually not quite sure what this chart is called, but little little blocks to show that the passage of time. Um, and, you know, using this, this, this method, you can easily compare um, the time Indigenous Australians have lived on the land compared to, you know, these, the, the white or modern Australians. And again, you can, you'll notice the, um, the simple and the minimal colour palette I've used, um, I've used here as well. So, you know, in keeping with my theme of keeping thing, things simple. Uh, okay. Um, so you can, you can find um, inspiration um, and data for, for a visualization anywhere. And, you know, I've found them um, in the most unlikely of places. So lesson number five, data is everywhere. So these days you can find data and inspiration on, you know, um, public uh, repositories such as, you know, Kaggle, um, data.world, and even Google has its own um, uh, data, data search. Most governments have publicly available data. Um, so here in Melbourne, the city of Melbourne has an open data portal um, and, you know, the, the city or the country that you live in might have something, something similar. Um, Melbourne has, um, in their open data portal, you know, everything from transportation data to data on, you know, trees that are maintained in Melbourne. Um, I've found inspiration on random websites and articles that I've read, um, as well as, um, you know, I've made visualizations with data that I've collected and curated myself. So, you know, self quantified data. Um, okay. So if you haven't seen this um, next viz before, um, this is my qualifying viz that got me to the Iron Viz finals. Um, and the theme was um, visualizing the arts. And um, as I was kind of planning my viz and trying to decide on a topic and um, what I wanted to viz about, I came across an old article. It was probably about five or six years old. Um, and it talked about the Archibald Prize winners 
Um, and I thought that it suited the topic really well. Um, so for those who don't know, the Archibald Prize is a portrait competition. It's run every year in Australia. Um, and basically, you know, it's uh, artists who are submitting portraits of um, famous or famous people or celebrities. And one of the criteria um, is that, you know, you have to be, um, you have to paint someone who is well known or distinguished. Um, so they tend to be like famous people. So after I got the data, I, I kind of started building out a viz looking at the winners, um, who they were, who they painted, um, what their genders were and their nationality. Um, and it kind of turned out to be this section of the viz here. So this is using map layers to kind of create um, this visual representation of um, the, the, the Archibald Prize winners for the last 100 years. And when I put this together, um, you know, something kind of really stuck, um, stood out at me. Um, I've used yellow to show where females have won and where females have been um, the subject of a, a winning portrait. Um, and I've also looked at the, um, the, the ethnicity of the artist. So we can see that Caucasian versus Indigenous. And, you know, when we look at this data set, we can see that, um, well, actually, there's only been one um, Indigenous winner in the 100 year history of the Archibald Prize. So, um, so this was quite a telling story. Um, and it, it kind of led me on this path. So after I, I, I developed this piece, um, or this section of the viz, I started to look to see if um, diversity in the arts was a widespread problem. And I found that I found that it was. So what I did was I included all that in my viz as well. Um, so then I can, I, you know, I go on to talk about art um, in general and how, you know, the, the, the diversity issues we see in art, how they manifest into things like, you know, the percentage of exhibiting artists who are, um, uh, who are, you know, di diverse and whether they're male or female um, and their ethnicity, the employee diversity of um, museums and art galleries. Um, and then, you know, the, the in terms of how much, um, how much uh, men, men and women are earning from art and, and the gap there. So, so this viz um, is a good example of when a random article, so this article that I found that was, you know, four or five years old, um, it kind of sparked inspiration and, and then prompted me to look at the bigger picture, to do more research um, and to create uh, this viz based on, on, on that, you know, that simple um, article that I found. So this next viz, um, we need to talk about period poverty. Um, actually won second place at the Women in Analytics um, Data Connect conference uh, back in uh, May or June, I think it was. Um, and it was also select, uh, selected as a viz of the day as well. Um, so it looks at period, what period poverty looks like around the world, um, and it aims to destigmatize the subject of periods. So what I was actually inspired to create this viz um, after reading a report. So I found a report online um, that uh, showed the attitude surrounding menstruation in Australia. And it found that a large number of people reported being ashamed when they were on their period or admitting that they lacked money and resources to purchase period products. So I decided um, this was a less talked about but very important topic um, and I turned it into a viz. So after reading the report, I jumped online and um, I wanted to find information about what period poverty looks like around the world. So, you know, I had information of what it looked like in Australia, but um, I wanted to see, you know, what it looks like um, in, in other parts of the world. And um, yeah, that led me to kind of, you know, um, show the, the true cost of having a period. So you know, it's it's quite costly. And um, what we were seeing in a lot of countries was that um, women and um, and people weren't able to afford um, these period products. Um, and then looking at um, what, you know, what it looks like during the pandemic um, and how that kind of affected period poverty and, um, you know, people's attitudes towards um, towards periods as well. Okay, so another INVIS entry, um, this time um, I used my own data to, to create this viz. Um, and this viz is about my first trip back to my homeland of Cambodia. 
Um, so you can see here, um, uh, I've got my journey timeline that shows, you know, how long I've spent in each in each city. Um, but I also did some research and supplemented my own quantified self quantified data with um, data that I found um, to 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 kind of add some extra context to um, to to my own data. So you know, we look at tourist arrivals in Siem Reap here, um, and then you know a couple of other bits of information about some of the other places that I visited. Um, and um, another, you know, interesting point about this viz is the use of maps. So, um, you know, I use the maps in this viz as um, a focus point and um, a storytelling device. You know, the, the lines um, uh, leading the viewer onto the next, the next, my next destination, and then the next section of the viz. So, um, you know, this is a good example of how um, I've used a mixture of, you know, found data or research data with my own self-quantified data. Um, so a good data visualization tells stories, um, and you know this is one of the one of the reasons why I love working in this space. So lesson number six: uh, tell your story. Um, data visualizations can be used to convey all sorts of stories and important messages. And so the last lesson I want to leave with you today is: don't be afraid to put yourself in the viz to tell your own story. You know you've seen how I done it, how I've done it with my own work. Um, and, you know, I'd encourage you to do it too. We can use data visualization to bring messages to life. We can use it to inspire action and to change behavior. And perhaps the most wonderful thing of all, um, we can use data visualization to, to change the world. Um, and lastly, if you want to connect with me, you can find me on LinkedIn, um, Tableau Public and on Twitter as well. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot, Kimberly. I can thank you for sharing all the best practices, tips and tricks on data visualization in You have uh, you have inspired everyone on that call to just go ahead and start investing on this skill over here. So thank you for that. No problem. Um, did we have any questions? Were there any questions from the group? Nothing in the chat I can see right now, not in the Q and A. Uh, if you have any questions for Kimberly, you want to go ahead and ask, just put it in the Q&A tab or raise your hand, happy to unmute you. In the meantime, everyone is thinking about it. I can ask you the first question, Kimberly. Uh, how did your journey started with Tableau? And I think that is the question someone is also asking about it. Yeah, yeah. So, um... I started using Tableau, I think I mentioned, um, when in my previous role to where I am today, um, I was working in an agency and one of our um, clients got Tableau. And because I was working in analytics, so uh, my background is in web analytics and website tracking, and they thought, you know, it's kind of related. So you can you can do data visualization as well, and you can use Tableau. So um, I actually was living in Singapore at the time, and I attended a uh, the Singapore Tableau user group and, um, you know, going there kind of inspired me to um, jump onto Tableau public and then um, onto Twitter. And when I jumped on Twitter, um, I discovered Makeover Monday and I started participating and then, you know, working on my Tableau skills, um, submitting my work into Makeover Monday. And yeah, it's kind of kind of grew from there. Thank you again for that. What has been the role of community in helping you to uh, work on these skills of data visualization and storytelling? Any tips and tricks you want to share with individuals who are just starting their journey with data? Yeah, yeah. I think the community has played a huge role um, in supporting my journey. Um, like I said, I discovered Twitter. Um, so I think if you're wanting to, to get involved in the community, um, the first thing you do is jump on Twitter, get connected to um, the community leaders out there, um, you know, I think most, if not all of the Tableau public ambassadors, all of the Tableau visionaries are on Twitter. Um, and, you know, that's where I kind of made my connections. Um, I don't know a lot of people who work on Tableau down here in Melbourne, but, you know, being on Twitter has allowed me to connect with people all, all over the world. Um, 
uh, I mentioned Make Over Monday. Um, so that is actually um, starting up again. And you know, if you're early in your Tableau or your data visualization learning journey, um, I can't recommend participating in Make Over Monday enough. Um, it, it really helped me with my skills, with my confidence. Um, and it's, you know, I, I don't think I would be where I am today without Makeover Monday. So get involved in those community activities. Makeover Monday is a great place to start. Um, there's a good one for beginners um, called Back to Viz Basics, um, which, which is also a good place to start. And then as you start to kind of get more confident in your skills and, um, you know, more um, involved in the community, you can branch out into, you know, some of the other um, community projects out there. But um, yeah, you know, jump on Twitter and just share your work, ask for feedback and, um, and just, just, yeah, just connect with people. Uh, there is one question which uh, Vijay is asking, what are the data, so where from, from where do you get the data sources for all the dashboards you have created on, on, on community initiatives which we talked about? Um, so some of the community projects will provide um, a data set. Uh, so Makeover Monday, they'll provide a data set. Back to Viz Basics, they'll provide a data set. Um, the, the work that I do outside of the um, community projects, so um, the, uh, you know, the Archibald Prize, um, where you have to source your own data, um, that's just, you know, jumping onto Google and, and doing a Google search and seeing where you end up. So, um, you know, if I have the, the, the idea of creating a visualization about period poverty, poverty, I would jump online and jump on Google and search for, you know, period poverty data sets or how does period poverty, um, what does period poverty look like around the world? So, um, and, you know, Google will kind of point you into to the right direction. You'll, you'll find articles and often, you know, those articles will, will point you to a report or point you to a data set um, or point you to, you know, a, a, um, a, a research article that has been written that use, uses data. So, you know, my main starting point um, is in fact Google. Thank you, Kathy, for that. Uh, there is one question. Uh, uh, how can we introduce stories in real-time dashboards with real-time large data? How can we um, introduce stories? In real-time dashboards. Like any feedback on that so if you're working with data set which is real time how we can go ahead and help in terms of telling a story from it um well i guess it depends how your dashboard is set up um you know i believe that um tableau now has uh, i can't remember what it's called um you might be able to jump in uh the ai generated um data stories yeah data, like yeah data stories so the ai generated um narration i guess or um uh, yeah. insights that that explain you know what's happening in in the data so that's probably you know if you're using tableau that's probably a good place to start but um with real time i think it, it might be quite difficult because you know your data is constantly changing and um if you need that human interaction or for someone to go in and and put the insights in or, or put some context or narration around that story um it, it might get a bit you know unwielding so using things like data stories um would probably be a good place to start. And just one last question for you. Uh, any three tips for individuals who are just starting with Tableau? Who are just starting with Tableau? Um, uh, attend any Tableau user groups if um, you have them in your region. And I know that there are a lot of um, a lot of virtual ones um, uh, ha happening at the moment. So attend that. Um, I think I said before, you know, connect with um, the community on Twitter um, and participate in um, the, the community challenges. So um, for me, I learn by doing and um, being involved and participating in these challenges and these projects um, really helped to kind of um, solidify my skills and um, allow me to to try out, um, you know, different chart types or different design styles. Um, and it allowed me to be a bit more creative in what I would create, um, you know, out, outside of work, you know, a lot of that stuff I can't do in, in, my, in my day job. So 
working on my um, my own work and working on the community projects allowed me to to kind of expand on the skills that I learned at work. Thank you, Kimberly. With that, uh, thanks a lot, Kimberly, for coming and presenting on this connect. It's an honor to have you. It's uh, an honor thank to be here. <laughs> thank you for inspiring us, and we look forward to your great work and keep inspiring and motivated us with your great visualization and storytelling skills. Right, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Take care and see you.